In this tutorial, I shall demonstrate the process of ECG interpretation. ECG interpretation is a skill, so it's important to use the same process every time you practice. ECGs, like any other medical test, should be interpreted in the context of the patient's symptoms. The file name for each video gives you the clue. This one is entitled, A Routine Recording from an Asymptomatic Medical Student. We'll always start looking at the ECG from a distance, like this, as if you were holding the whole ECG in your hands. You'll notice throughout all of the interpreted ECGs on ECG Zone that we'll completely ignore the computer interpretation at the top of the ECG. This is because it's so frequently wrong. As you'll see here, the computer thinks that this medical student was having a myocardial infarction. They weren't. Now, let's run step by step through the process of interpreting this ECG. Firstly, we'll calculate the patient's heart rate. This is usually best done from the rhythm strip, and there are two ways of doing it. When a patient's heartbeat is regular, one can estimate the heart rate from the distance between any two adjacent heartbeats. This is done with a simple rule of thumb. You take the number of large squares between two heartbeats, here there are four large squares between these two complexes, and you divide 300 by that number. 300 divided by 4 is 75, so the patient's heart rate is 75 beats per minute. This rule of thumb only works, however, if the patient's heart rate is very regular. Further along this ECG, you'll see that there are closer to three large squares between each pair of beats. 300 divided by 3 is 100, so at this point, the patient's heart rate was 100 beats per minute. Looking at the whole rhythm strip again, this irregularity can now be seen, and it's probably better to take an average than to use any pair of beats to calculate the heart rate. Given that the whole ECG takes 10 seconds to record, and there are 6 lots of 10 seconds in one minute, to calculate the patient's heart rate in beats per minute, all you have to do is add up the complexes, here 13, and times them by 6. 6 times 13 is 78, the patient's heart rate was 78 beats per minute. Unsurprisingly, this is somewhere between the 75 and 100 beats per minute that the other method of calculation gave. To summarise, we'll start by calculating the heart rate. If the rhythm is regular, we'll use the distance between any two heart beats, or the RR interval, to calculate the heart rate. If there's any evidence of irregularity, we'll calculate the average by calculating the total number across the 10 seconds of recording and timesing it by 6. After rate, we will consider rhythm. By this we mean the actual electrical rhythm the heart is in, i.e. normal sinus rhythm, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, etc. Not just whether the heart rate is regular or irregular, which you can tell from feeling the patient's pulse. It's usually possible to diagnose the rhythm from the rhythm strip alone, although in some cases it can be a lot more difficult than this. Here, the rhythm is normal sinus rhythm, with a P wave preceding every QRS complex, and a QRS complex following every P wave. After rate and rhythm, we'll consider axis. Calculating the axis is something some people find quite difficult, so I point you in the direction of a separate tutorial regarding calculating axis. The simplest ways of doing this consider leads 1 and 2 alone, so that's where we will always look. Here, the QRS complex goes up more than it goes down, i.e. it's positive in lead 1, and up more than it goes down, i.e. it's positive in lead 2. Positive complexes in lead 1 and lead 2 give a normal axis. After rate, rhythm and axis, the interpreter works their way through P, PR, QRS, ST and T waves in that order. For each of these waves we're interested in both their duration and their morphology. The duration will be the same wherever it's recorded on the ECG, so to calculate the lengths of things, one just looks where they're best displayed. This is often why lead 2 is chosen as the rhythm strip, because it gives a classical and well-defined image of the ECG complex.
when one's looking at the morphology of the ECG waves, this becomes more complicated. The ECG, as described in tutorial 1, comprises 12 individual graphs, each of which referring to a different electrical camera pointing at a different aspect of the patient's heart. In order to interpret an ECG in full, you have to read each of these individual graphs. With practice, the eye gets very quick at doing this. As has already been discussed with rhythm, P waves are clearly visible and directly related to the QRS complexes in this ECG. Looking once again at lead 2, the PR interval, measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, measures 3.5 small squares. Normal duration for the PR interval is between 3 and 5 small squares and therefore is normal. One can calculate the duration of the QRS complex wherever it is seen best. As is often the case in this ECG, it's seen very well in lead 2 and therefore the rhythm strip. Here the QRS duration measures 2 small squares and is therefore normal at less than 3 small squares. After measuring the QRS duration, we survey for pathological Q waves. There are no pathological Q waves present on this ECG, but remember, a pathological Q wave is a morphological feature, and therefore in order to make that statement, one has to look at every one of the 12 individual leads of the ECG. This will seem like a laborious process at first, but as with any language, your eye will learn to scan across the image and pick out the important features and abnormalities for you. When you're learning to read the ECG, it's important that you force yourself to read each of the 12 graphs individually. Rushing this process will mean that you fail to pick up on important abnormalities and fail to learn how to read the ECG properly. After rate, rhythm, axis, P waves, PR interval, QRS duration, and Q wave morphology, we move on to the ST segment, which is arguably the most useful feature of the ECG. Since, once again, this is a morphological feature, you need to scan all 12 leads of the ECG. Here, there are no abnormalities of the ST segment. Both a beginner's eye and an automated interpretation might suggest that there's ST segment elevation anteriorly. There isn't, and with plenty of practice you'll get much better than a beginner and much better than a computer at interpreting ST segments. Most important is to take into account the clinical features. Remember, this ECG was a routine recording from an asymptomatic medical student. Finally, we come to the T waves. Once again, these are a morphological feature, which require you to look at all 12 leads of the ECG. You'll notice on this ECG that the T wave morphology is completely normal, with upright T waves in all of the leads except for AVR. T wave inversion in AVR is almost unanimous. Finally, we take a step back to put it all together. This is a 12 lead ECG recorded from an asymptomatic medical student. The rate is 78 beats per minute in normal sinus rhythm. The axis is normal. The P waves are present with a normal PR interval, and the QRS complexes show a normal duration. There are no diagnostic ST or T wave changes. In summary, this is a normal ECG. Unless specific features of an ECG dictate we should do otherwise, we'll work through the order of service, rate, rhythm, axis, P waves, PR interval, QRS duration, Q wave morphology, ST segment morphology, T wave morphology, and putting it all together for every one of the ECGs on this site.